pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Brian uh, Carpenter. Carpenter is a uh, friend of mine. He's worked in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, then he made a transition over into teaching high school and then classroom and then into the virtual world. That's right. And he's going to tell you a little bit about uh, his journey and hopefully you guys will learn something from it uh, for your own career path. Thank you. Brian, All right. Here. Well, thank you, Dr. Mosey. Thank you for having me uh, today to come and talk to you for your Science Works Careers in Science series. I am the uh, the chemist representing and the and scientists, you're, and, you're the first speaker and I'm the first speaker. So I got the I'm going to set the bar, and we're going to go from there. So I entitled my talk A to T: A Chemist Journey. Um, A to T being atoms. To teaching. So going from what I learned about uh, chemistry to what I can teach other people about chemistry and the points in between. There's many discoveries that we can, um, things we can do as scientists to uh, change the world. And uh, one that was uh, rather profound back a long time ago was uh, these two fellows. Um, they were the, you know, the cavemen and they, they were the cavemen scientists that discovered the, what dirt was. And they, they, they assigned it the atomic symbol DE. And uh, we now can understand dirt and play with it and build things with it like these buildings and things. But before that, they were just, you know, they did, it was around them and they didn't understand it. As scientists, that's what we do is we interact with the natural world. We um, learn about the natural world so that we can exploit it and use it to our advantage and to protect and keep it safe so that we can use it again in the future. Um, All right, what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about chemistry as a career. Where can it take you? I'm going to talk about myself, tell you a little bit about my history, where I've come from, academics of myself, industry experience, and my educational career, which is going on today, and some concluding remarks. In simplest terms, um, chemistry is the science of matter. It is anything that can be touched, smelled, um, tasted, seen, or felt, and those things are all made of chemicals. If we look around us, there's chemicals all around us. We wouldn't be in this building if it wasn't for chemistry. Chemists are people who transform everyday materials, like dirt for example, into amazing things like bricks. The brick is a piece of dirt that now we can put on the wall and we can build things out of those, okay? So transforming those things. This comes from the American Chemical Society website uh, where they talk about careers in science. At Langara College here, I went to your website, your college website, and I found, doing a search under the searches for careers in science, a uh, description about the different areas that you can study once you get a science degree. What can you do? You can work in industry, pharmaceuticals, oils and gas, food and agriculture, instrumentation, and, in, and service industry. As academics, we can become instructors like Dr. Mosey and myself. We can teach at the post-secondary or post-secondary levels. Government. It needs scientists, needs chemists, and uh, there's lots that you can do there with Environment Canada, meteorology and things like that, and non-traditional are things beyond what we think of as traditional chemist jobs. Chemistry is the central science. We see here, I got it in the middle, I'm kind of proud because I am a chemist and I think, you know, it it's all comes from here. If you ask the physicists, they'll say, well, it all starts with motion and then things go from there. So it's a big debate, but you know, the point is, chemistry is the center of it all. And uh, from that, we have biology, we got meteorology, oceanology, medicine is very important, right? But from that, chemistry comes from it at the beginning. Different branches of chemistry are things like organic chemistry. Some of you may be studying organic. How many of you looked at organic chemistry yet? Okay, so organic deals with carbon-based um, compounds. We've got inorganic chemistry, which deals with the rest of the periodic table. You know, it's amazing how you got one branch that's so massive, and the other branch is large, but uh, organic is incredibly large. Physical chemistry looks at how we can manipulate and understand chemicals and compounds. Dr. Mosey instructs on this in first year chemistry um, where we can look at wave properties of electrons and particle properties of electrons. We can look at um, how we can use that understanding to affect the world around us. 
We've got biochemistry, where we look at chemistry and its interaction with us, with living things, primarily with us, but also, you know, living organisms, animals, and things like that. Veterinary science is important, re relies on biochemistry. Analytical chemistry, where we're looking at the, comp the, the, the quantity of a certain chemical in something else, like, for example, the Olympics, right? You know, those guys are supposed to come there all drug-free. The analytical chemist takes a sample of their blood and doing some number of tests goes, they're clear. They can now accept the gold medal. Or after they get the gold medal, they do that drug testing, etc. And that's an, a branch of analytical chemistry. There's lots that happens in analytical chemistry that um, we... Um, rely on, all, on on a regular basis. I talked about these different areas already, so we'll just flash through those. All right, other branches of chemistry, nanochemistry, looking at particles that are super small. The atom is very small, but we're looking at little machines, little tiny machines that we build out of a group of atoms to make molecules and cages and structures like that. That can be used as, say, for example, chemotherapy delivery systems. If we can take a drug and put it inside this inorganic cage, inject it into your body, and it goes cruising along, this little machine gets to where it needs to go, opens up the cell, delivers the payload, we can selectively treat people with chemotherapy. Right now, this is, in the, in the, in, is coming along. Um, it's an area of development, and that's quite interesting. Combinatorial chemistry, where we take a starting scaffold of something, and then we elaborate and make many different kinds of compounds off of that very quickly. Astrochemistry, looking into the heavens, how do we understand what stars are made of? Okay, so there are chemists that are involved in spectral analysis that help astronomers understand what stars are made of. And also that's important when we're trying to go to Mars and live there one day or something like that. Okay? Environmental chemistry relies on protecting our environment, understanding how that environment outside is gonna get is gonna affect us so that we can make predictions so I can know whether I need to take an umbrella with me to work or not. Food chemistry, my wife loves to cook. I am learning all kinds of cool things about cooking. Cooking is awesome, but there is so much chemistry that's involved in cooking. I was at a uh, professional development talk and a chef named Ian Lai, he works at uh, culinary school in Vancouver. He started talking to us about, is it science or is it cooking? You know, and the difference between those two things. And we rely on the fact that we can do science in order to improve a recipe, for example. Solid state chemistry allows us to have things like our iPhones, where there are computers in these boxes that are absolutely amazing, and that's solid state chemistry. Material chemistry, where we look at things like, why does the Portman Bridge ice up, right? Why does that bridge deck get so icy? You know, that's materials chemistry. So there are solutions for these things. Forensic chemistry, the police bust a guy, and they gotta prove that he was there. Okay, so that's looking at that kind of evidence. And medical chemistry, where we look at making pharmaceuticals and things like that. An example in everyday life, does anybody recognize what this is? What's this represent? Where have you ever seen that before? No idea. I saw it when I was in elementary school. It's called the fire triangle, right? We have three components of fire, fire being in the middle, right? We have heat, we have fuel, and we have oxygen. We need those three things in order for a fire to proceed, okay? I've got a general scheme here where we have a carbohydrate structure, say a chunk of wood, for example, that's sitting in a fire pit. So a chunk of wood's made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, cellulose, and all these kind of different crazy proteins sitting there. Oxygen is all around us in the air. It's all around us, right? But this isn't going to get going until we have sufficient energy for this forward reaction to start. Okay? So the forward reaction's got to get started, and then we get carbon dioxide and lots of water out that. And then the coolest part, the energy that we see. I love to sit there at a, around a campfire when I'm camping and observe the campfire and just enjoy the fact that it's nice and warm and all those kinds of things. So if we didn't understand <coughs> chemistry, it'd be hard to have a fire keep going, you know? You gotta make sure it breathes and things like that. Okay, so looking around us, there's many things. What do we see? We see the seats that we're sitting on. Those comfy, cushy seats are a result of chemistry. The paint on the walls is a result of chemistry. The fact that this glass is clean, is a result of chemistry, right? So I can drink. Yes, sir? The fact our bodies exist is a result of chemistry. 
That's right, exactly. There is so much chemistry going on right now inside our bodies that when we take a breath of air in, and how that oxygen gets into our bloodstream and goes cruising around our bodies to support our muscles, that's a result of chemistry, okay? So we have um, things we've eaten for breakfast, things that we have, um, there's lots of products of chemistry that are all around us, and I mentioned the Portman Bridge earlier. That problem they have with those cables, ice falls on cars. That's a danger, right? Big problem. But they've got some solutions. There are, there's a mylar wrap wrapped around each of those, all those cables, a plastic coating that is not supposed to allow condensation and buildup of moisture that would form ice, but it didn't work, okay? So that's one problem, right? Another solution to that would be to take and wrap it in heat tape so that we have an electrical current that can go up and down through those cables. That's another idea that they have, but the problem with that is that it's gonna degrade the cables and shorten the lifespan of that bridge. There's a third one. Can't remember what the third one was. But there's a solution that I've heard about um, that may, may help them out. And uh, it's called Never Wet. It's a compound, actually it's on YouTube. And these guys have patented this product that sheds water very quickly. Almost like Rain-X except significantly better. Like you can put it on your hand, stick your hand in a, glass of, in a, in a container of water, pull it out and your hand is actually dry because the water doesn't adhere to the, to the uh, polymer that's on your hand. So that might be another way to get around that. Industry depends on chemistry. Many professions and occupations need some knowledge of chemistry within them. You know, you got your man food manufacturing places that need to have chemists involved at some stage. You know, a bakery can go on with bakers, but if we don't have chemists to make sure that there's good quality control, we're not able to sell that product on the market to, and so that we can say that in this package is what we say is in this package. So there's chemistry involved there. The application of theories in chemistry produce new and better materials, kind of like that never wet product, kind of like uh, Rain-X, kind of like, I don't know, all kinds of things that are all around us. Everyday experiences at home and in the community are explained by chemistry. Careers in chemistry. With chemistry as a foundation, we can get into things like medicine, toxicology, law is important, right? Education, pharmaceuticals. This is the area that I worked in previously. Environmental chemistry, I worked in that area as well as an undergrad. Physics, and all kinds of things like this. Like I said, many industries are chemistry based and we need to have chemists at different stages. Chemistry and commerce. A chemistry degree is a good training to acquire skills in math, problem solving and communication of research, self man or, and, and, and all kinds of things like that. With an undergrad degree in chemistry or even science in general, you've been taught to think. You leave here knowing a great body of knowledge, but the most important thing that we hope that you leave education from with, with when you leave education, is the ability to think and to problem solve and deal with things that you haven't seen before, okay? We want to be able to walk out of these doors and be an effective, you know, contributing member to society and we rely on the fact that you're able to think. You're able to challenge things, not just reproduce and do things like you've always done. Careers in journalism. Science journalists narrow the gap between science technology and the public. So, you know, we have people talking about the Portman Bridge, trying to explain the problem of icing up those cables. We need a science to, scientist to possibly break that down so that the average person driving across the bridge, listening to the news, can understand that. Okay, there's a lot of conversation that goes along in the newspapers and in the media that relies <coughs> on some scientific expertise. Solving crimes, understanding forgery, you know, the fire department hires chemists as arson, you know, investigators. So if a, a building burns, they'll have people go in and uh, look at why this fire started and things like that. Entrepreneurship, having know-how, how to develop things, how to do quality assessment is important. Health sciences and related professions where we make pharmaceuticals, even in teaching. Okay, if we didn't have a background in science, it would be hard, very hard for me and uh, Dr. Mosey to be able to teach science. We need to have that understanding, that knowledge that's beyond that of our students in order to be able to teach them the basic things. Okay. 
about myself. I was born in Calgary in 1970. I grew up in a small family. I had a, a sister, mom and dad, and we lived in Calgary. I did chemistry at home in my middle years. I didn't realize I was doing chemistry, but I was doing some really rad, cool chemistry. Um, I got busted one day. My, sis my sister and I, we, we happened into the bathroom. We had a double set of double sinks. We took everything out from underneath the sink, we poured it in the sink, and fortunately, nothing happened. Okay, so it was a non-reaction, which was a very good result for us to have in that situation. But mom and dad busted us, and it worked out that, you know, we were doing a little science, trying to figure out something and trying to see what would happen when we mix things. I also played with matches. How many people here like to play with matches? You, you know, we're not going to mention your names and things like that, you know, but ma that's really cool. That's an awesome chemical reaction when you light a match, right? And it burns. Um, I graduated from Crescent Heights High School in 1988 and was headed in the direction of um, some things. So I'll, this is just a bit of background about myself. Um, I did my Bachelor's of Science at the University of Calgary and I graduated in 97. I completed my Master's of Science at the same, at the same university and graduated in 99. I happened out here to Langley after applying for a number of jobs all across the continent with my wife Wendy and uh, started working at a place called Anermed. Anermed is when Andrew and I kind of got to know each other a little bit. Her wife, his wife and myself shared an office at the uh, drug company. She was a biologist at the company and I was a chemist and we shared an office and got to know each other so there was interaction there. After I was done at the pharmaceutical company, I got my bachelor's of education at SFU in 2008 and currently I am a teacher in the Abbotsford School District teaching secondary math and science. I began UFC in general studies to become a geophysicist. I started off university going, I know this guy. He wears hiking boots to work. He has to walk around out in the field and look at rocks. I'm like, what a cool job. That's an awesome job. Incredible job. But then I started looking into what a geophysicist does and I changed my perspective because of the number of prospects for myself and the limitation of where I was at in the world for geophysics. Um, there was, you know, you're getting into energy, you're getting into fossil fuels, you're getting into um, things like that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with geophysics, but my, for myself, I thought that was kind of limiting because in Alberta, it's all oil and gas, and you're getting into the oil field to be going to look for energy that's buried in the ground. So I changed over to chemistry, and I, um, my undergrad education included all manner of general courses, kind of like you're taking here at Langara College and beyond. In my fourth, third year of university, I got into the chemical, the cooperative education program where I was an uh, environmental chem chemist. I worked in an ana for an analytical services company called Chemex in Edmonton for eight months. That really opened my eyes to whether I wanted to, what I wanted to do. I went into this job going, analytical chemistry is awesome. I get to figure stuff out and I can tell you how many particles of something there are in this little container. I got to work and I discovered for myself that I didn't like that very much because every day I would do the same thing every day. They'd give me a glass of water and say, how much, how much sodium is in here? The next day they'd give me another container of water, how much sodium is in here? And I'd repeat that. It just became very mon mundane and boring for myself. After that I decided I needed to do something different because, okay, that's, my, that's, a, that's an experience for eight months. and. Uh, I started working at SO Resources doing physical and inorganic chemical research. Um, my job there was to take a piece of field pipeline and that it was starting to corrode and break down and so we don't have pipeline failures and oil and gas spilling out all over the environment. <clears throat> they want to be able to control how corrosion happens. My job there was to, um, my job was to initiate corrosion within this pipe. So we have this pipe and my job was to start corrosion happening in a controlled environment in the lab and then my boss that I was working with, my supervisor, had these awesome chemicals that he could put in and stop the corrosion and we were trying to um, replicate what happens in the field in the lab so that his inhibitors could actually work. Um, from that, that was a very challenging process. <clears throat> I had six months of non-results so that was a long time to go to work every day not having results. Uh, my undergrad education continued. I um, worked as a, did an honors project in an organic chemistry lab. That experience at ESSO where I was doing research really showed me that you know what, you don't have to know what you're doing necessarily to do cool things. You need to 
be brave and step forward and keep moving. Um, I started working in this organic lab and while I was there, Dr. Ian Hunt, he was my uh, fourth year um, lab instructor for the labs for organic chemistry, advanced organic chemistry, and he challenged me every day I was in the labs to think for myself. I got the roughest marks that I got in my university career in that course, in that lab course, but he pushed me and he pushed me and pushed me to think and challenge the way I thought about chemistry. One day he said, Brian, do you want to, what are you doing for the summer? I said, I don't know. He says, do you want to come work in, my, in our lab? This was Dr. Uh, Dr. Brian Kay, and he was away on sabbatical, so Ian was kind of like the senior scientist in charge. And he's like, I'll just send the boss an email and we'll get you in. I got in there and within two months of being in there, um, Ian got me working on this chemical reaction at the bottom here, where we take this cyclic um, compound, open it up selectively in a, in a, with a, with a, I can't even remember that reaction. It's been a long, what's that? Is that, yeah, that's a green yard reaction, that's right. We open it up with a green yard, do some enzyme chemistry on it to separate this enantiomer from this enantiomer. And we did that effectively, and one day we shot that into the enantioselective G, or uh, was it GC? No, LCMS. And he saw these two peaks come out, and they were nice and resolved. We got two individual peaks, and I saw this light in his eyes I'd never seen before. Because I wasn't doing research before that was actually super duper exciting. He said, man, we can get a paper out of this. I said, what? And within two months, we had this paper in tetrahedron asymmetry, a small communication paper that launched my organic chemical research. Skills that I developed in uh, in my undergrad were understanding the scientific method and being able to conduct a sound scientific experiment. What is the scientific method? It involves making a hypothesis. It involves doing research. It involves setting up an experiment so that you can effectively gather information that you can move forward with in a, in a direction that takes you into things that you haven't done before. Um, I learned from a result of my work at ESSO and even in the lab that all results are valuable, especially the negative results. Um, persistence is inv invaluable in the lab. Being persistent when you're doing chemistry and doing science is really important. Failure recovery, learning from mistakes and growing from the hard lessons, okay? So Einstein said, anyone who has, ever made a mis has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. And that's, imp that's important to know. The reason that my daughter of four years old makes, she makes mistakes, but she learns, is because she tries stuff she's never done before. She jumps off the coffee table, boom, lands and hurts herself. She's like, huh, that wasn't such a good idea, and she's learned something, right? We do science every day. We don't realize we're doing science every day, but we do. Failure recovery is one of those important things that will allow us to move forward instead of sitting on the couch and not doing anything. I graduated in 97 with a specialization in uh, applied chemistry and organic research from my undergrad research project that I did. My master's of science, there's a prof there that uh, I, he was a new instructor, he had one grad student at the time when I started talking to him and by the time I got there into his lab he had three or four of us. I was um, challenged by Dr. Warren Pierce to uh, to de develop a compound, this was a uh, bispentafluorophenylborylated ferrocene compound to th this one right here where we have an iron here inside of a five-membered ring and another five-membered ring. It's a sandwich compound called ferrocene. It's a, it's a very simple organometallic compound, organometallic because we have a metal and we have organic rings around it. And my job was to take and stick a boron on one of those five-membered rings that had these two big aromatic um, rings attached to it in this big fan structure. And uh, this was the crystal structure of one of the compounds that I had made. This was my baby, okay? So I got there, I made this thing within three months. It was awesome, it was great. We got positive results right off the bat. That's a really important for learning stuff because then it just keeps you motivated. Um, the goal was to produce a single molecule, molecule activator for a Ziegler nata, nata olefin polymerization catalyst. What was that exactly? That's making plastic, okay? When we make plastic like polyethylene, the stuff that uh, pens and plastic bags and all that's made out of, there's a metal, an organometallic compound that's involved at the very beginning of the plastic molecule growing into something very large and very 
importance in our, in our day and age. This compound here was a zirconium compound that was dimethylated. It had these two aromatic rings on it for stability. And uh, the, the idea was for a Lewis acid, kind of like um, trispentafluorophenylborane, this uh, Lewis acid here, to come in and extract one of the methyl groups as a contact ion pair and eventually dissociate it, to pull it right off of there. Okay, so this piece here is now an active catalyst and it's sitting there waiting for to do something. We uh, would take some ethylene gas, ethylene being carbon C2H4, um, it's got a double bond in it, that would come in and stick in here on this, this uh, empty spot on the zirconium and then tip sideways and produce a big long plastic chain off of that that would grow to 1,000 or 10,000 you know, olefin or monomer units long. But it didn't work, okay? when I replace this with my compound, okay? So this process here worked with this compound, but my compound didn't work. This leads to uh, attempting to explain why it didn't work, and thus the rest of my thesis. My boss said to me, Brian, why didn't it work? We made this compound, we sent it off to Nova Gas, they put it in their reactor, we're all waiting, we're sitting, we're sitting at the university waiting for results. And they call, they go, didn't work. We're like, what do you mean it didn't work? Well, we don't know, we'll try it again. They tried three times in a row, no results. And I'm going, oh, so much for that. He says, why not? And that's the rest of my thesis. My thesis, I took and, and elaborated on, on uh, this compound here by changing the structure of it, adding other things, to learn about this through space interaction between the iron electrons, the lone pair of electrons that are out here, and this empty p orbital that takes and actually bends this boron down out of the plane. It should be, we're, we were hoping that this boron would live up here above the plane of this uh, five-membered ring, but instead it was bent down, making this an in, in, ineffective Lewis acid, which was uh, quite interesting. I learned persistence when adversity strikes. Man, that was a rough day when I learned that the compound didn't do what we said it did, right? Then I had to like, with him and being creative, we had to figure out how to explain and prove exactly that it was what it was. Critical thinking and problem solving was important. Research skills, looking at literature um, for useful information. This was before the days of Google, okay? We had a thing called web crawler, which was not really effective like Google is today. Today I can sit down at Google and type in three words. I can look at pictures of stuff, right? It's just amazing. Web crawler back then just didn't do it. I had to actually go to the library, look in books. Okay, so all the journals that we read today are all online and available to us. I discovered my passion for teaching as a result of teaching organic chemistry labs during my, during my grad, grad studies. So part of my job, so that I could help pay tuition, was to teach undergrad labs. So kind of like the labs you guys go to where your lab instructors are there, I learned that I really enjoyed teaching and that was a tension between me and my boss about production and teaching. And so that was kind of a, a struggle that was there. Um, understanding my skills outside of my field of study was really important. How, what other things did I learn from my grads, from, from grad school that I can take into other areas of my life? I started at Anermed in, in Langley, like I mentioned, and this was a far, small pharmaceutical company. It had, I think, 100 people um, there when I started back just around the time in, in 2000. Not even. 80, like 75 or 50 people. It was, it was actually quite small quite small company, um, but Renee, Andrew's wife, she was there, and uh, I, I, did, I worked there for seven years. I was an organic synthetic chemist. My grad studies didn't train me to be an organic synthetic chemist, but when I was applying for work, Dr. Piers encouraged me, he says, Brian, when you're applying for jobs, you're looking for a synthetic chemistry job. Don't tell them you're an organometallic synthetic chemist, because that's kind of a very small, limited field. The point that he was trying to get at and encourage me about was the fact that I know things and I got skills beyond what I was trained to do because I was trained to think and problem solve. I worked there as an organic chemist for those seven years. We were working on HIV therapies where we were uh, trying to affect the CXCR4 and CCR5 receptors in cells. This would help um, HIV patients, patients that have um, active HIV and, and AIDS to have a better quality of life. Um, medicinal chemistry, I worked in that group for four years where we would take small quantities of an, a starting material, like a, like a basic scaffold structure, and change the functional groups that were on it. Um, 
I would make between 10 and 100 milligram scales. So that's, you can see that it take a little tiny vial, and it's the amount that you can put in the bottom of the vial of product of these novel compounds. These were pre-drugs. We weren't actually making drugs at that point because we hadn't proved that they were drugs. We were making novel compounds, really cool compounds. And I was also involved in intermediate scale-up for the medicinal group where we would take and uh, make, um, have a piece that other chemists could use to grow and elaborate on. I produced and characterized over, you know, hundreds of novel compounds for these two programs. Also, uh, our company was involved in um, cancer therapy research where we would take, um, we had a, a stem cell mobilizer and uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, after my time at the, in, during the medicinal group, I got into the process and development chemistry group. I did that for three years. Here, we were starting at the place the medicinal chemists were at 100 milligram scale and working up to three quarters of a kilogram. We could take and fill this pitcher with the compound that we made. Okay, three, even more because it's nice and light and fluffy and we could fill two pictures full of this stuff. And we were, that was our job at the, at the drug company to uh, work on that scale. These, some of this material on the larger scale that we would do would be preclinical drug supply where we would have to do animal studies and unfortunately animal studies is a necessary part of pharmacy. I don't want to be taking something that has been deemed to kill rats, okay, because that's not good. Probably would do me in. It's not safe, okay. So I know the rats are cute and special and I'm sorry if you have a heart for them. You know, I do too, but I also have a heart for, you know, Dr. Mosey and the rest of you and making sure that when we take a Tylenol, it doesn't do us in, okay. So that's an important thing. So our job was to make preclinical drug supply and uh, establish processes for clinical production. So we would take the, the, the roots um, to compounds, and this is one particular compound that we made, um, 15, or one, 15, 5, 48, and we had names, numbers for all of our compounds. When I started, we were down in the 6,000 range of compounds at the drug company, and then we got into the 15,000 range by the time I was there after seven years. Every compound we made got a new number. We, um, in, the, in the process development group, came up with a practical convergence um, laboratory scale synthesis of a CCR re uh, receptor antagonist. So this is like a key, okay? You take your key and you walk up to the door and put it in, it fits, it fits in, but then you turn it and it opens the door, okay? So our job was to make a key that fit in that lock and stayed in that lock to prevent HIV from coming into that lock and, and, and being able to open up the door to be able to allow it to um, infect the cell. Um, we got a paper out of this that was in uh, Organic Process Research and Development Chemistry this uh, couple of years, just even just last year. And this was a highlight of my career at Anamed. Um, we had this converging synthesis where we took these commercially available compounds and through some elaborate schemes, we're able to combine them and get down here to our final compound. Okay, this looks very complicated and it is complicated, but this is convergent organic synthesis. It's very exciting because you can have two different people working on the same project at different places and then they, at one point you put all your materials together to make larger compounds that we can finally characterize and hopefully one day will become drugs. A key intermediate towards this was this, um, this ketone um, amine compound here with a nitrile and uh, during my time at Anermeta when I was uh, in early in the process development days in my like fifth, in, in my fourth year there, um, I was tasked with taking and making some of this because one of our medicinal chemists wanted it and they said, well, Brian, he can make that. Let's make, give him that job. So that became my job. I made it. I made it on like a one gram scale, which was pretty big for the time. And from that, we uh, deemed that that piece was an important piece for a number of compounds that we wanted to make in the future. So the medicinal chemist said, we need more of that. So what did I do the next day? I went, well, not the next day. This took about two weeks to do the whole thing to get it nice and pure, I would go back, starting here, and do this again. I had a lab notebook that was about 150 pages long, actually I had two of them, that were full of this stuff right here, okay? In literature, this started off as um, uh, overall, over these six steps, one, two, three, all these six steps here, we had an overall uh, chemical yield 
of our final product of at most 9%. So that's what we got out of the literature, the paper that I was reading, which is pretty good for a six step sequence. By the time I was done with it, we were able to consistently make compounds, this compound on 300 to 400 gram scale, that would fill half of this pitcher at a 35% overall yield, okay? So that means that we were Five, almost four or five times more effective than what the literature said it was. That saves thousands of dollars if you can do it five times better yield over those six steps. Um, and that was a really huge part and I played that I played in it. When we got back to this synthesis here where we take that compound right there and move forward, we uh, commissioned that out to a process company in Vancouver that took it and they took the process that I had developed and as scientists it's important for somebody else to re reproduce your work. This was our way of saying this is reproducible not just a magic trick that we can do and they actually made the compound, delivered it and half a kilogram arrived one day. The following day I went into the lab and dumped it in the reactor and that half a kilogram that cost $15,000 was gone. I took $15,000 worth of chemical and dumped it into the, I was nervous that day. I got nervous, okay, because you're like, oh, this is big money, right? It's huge money, okay? So this compound, this compound, the amount that we made, I have no idea what the, of what the final cost of it was, but after our time and three months of a team of six of us working 12 hours a day on this big sequence, we managed to come up with lots of that that we could do studies on. Here's the pictures of our reactor. This is a 20 liter um, glass reactor. It's green because there's an outside jacket, like a kind of like your Starbucks mug that has that air gap around it that keeps your coffee nice and, and warm. Um, this is filled with antifreeze that's hooked up over here to a, a heat exchanger, and that heat exchanger circulates the antifreeze around the reactor to help maintain the temperature. Okay, so that's that. Here's some of our other um, equipment that we use. In the scale up in the process group, we would do column chromatography. How many of you have done column chromatography here in organic, right? Your columns were itty bitty columns, right? Little tiny long columns. You put your stuff on top. We would take and put 200 grams of material on top of there and purify it over this space here. We'd use like, four, I'd sit there and go through 40 liters of hexane in a day. I just have gallons of the stuff that I would pour and mix up. This is our roto evaporator. This bulb is 20 liters in size. Okay, so it was huge, really big. And we would strip off the solvent so that we could get our final drug compound. And this was processes that we went through on a regular basis. Okay. What else? Here's some, this is one reaction of those that, on that big sequence that I showed you. These are the starting materials and the volumes that we were pouring into the reactor to get um, a product after this. This is one starting material, this is another, and these are reagents that we would use to add to uh, get the reaction to go nicely. This is me working in the walk-in fume hood. We could actually walk inside that thing, pull the window down. That's pretty exciting when you step in there pull the window down so your buddies on the outside don't get infected or you know contaminated and uh, you work in the in, uh, put your stuff in the top through that that funnel there into the reactor and then you drain it off the bottom you put it in the roto evaporator here strip off the solvent take this compound that's in here and then we would load that on top of the column and clean it up and get our nice pure compound out of the bottom okay some of my colleagues that I worked with um, this is gong and Matt uh, Michael, David, who's out in, on, in uh, he's in Quebec now. Jenny and Trevor, we, man, we had a lot of good times in the lab, a lot of stressful times in the lab, and uh, we learned, it was, you know, it was a great community of doing some work. I use skills that I learned in my undergrad on a regular basis. How many people have done TLC chromatography, thin layer chromatography? We would use that every day, every day. So, you know, you go, man, this is so archaic. Why use this, right? Every day in the lab, we would do thin layer chromatography to monitor our, the progress of our chemical reactions. We would use gas chromatography mass spec to identify our compounds and show that we were actually making what we said we were making. We had a 300 megahertz um, NMR um, that we would use and routinely we would do um, proton NMR and we would in, make our samples, walk down the hall, put our name on the sign up board so that we'd have to wait our, our time in line for the next chemist in front of us to get out of the way so that we can put our sample in the machine, get our spectrum, and look at it and go, yep, reaction's done, just so we can monitor and make sure that we're making the right product. 
We would use silica gel chromatography on a regular basis. Funny story, this silica gel chromatography, I think I did that in my undergrad. I didn't do it at all in my grad studies at all. So I started at the drug company, I'm like, I remember kind of how to do that. So it was one of those things that I had to remind myself of and I had to learn. An anti selective synthesis from a chiral pool or via chiral separation, so doing chiral um, chromatography. In uh, 2006, December 2006, Anamed was purchased by Genzyme Inc., at which point um, our research group kind of got stopped. Um, Genzymes are one of the big leaders in um, drug development in the world. They actually just got bought last year by another company, um, so they're no longer just themselves. They're owned by somebody else, which is quite interesting. But they came up and they swallowed Anamed like a big fish, right? Now, the reason they swallowed us was not because of any of the work that I was doing. That was really cool work. That was awesome work. It was incredible work because I, you know, for me, I was, I was pretty proud of that, right? But they actually didn't care about any of that work. What they cared about was another compound, which was a stem cell mobilizer, which today is on the market called Mozabil. And Anamed, during the time that we were doing all this other work, was pushing Mozabil through, called AMD 3100 at the time, that was back way, you know, like in the 3,000 compounds. They pushed that compound through and found that it would mobilize stem cells out of your bone marrow into your circulating blood. So by paying attention to a serendipitous observation made during clinical trials for HIV therapy, they took and applied it to another area of research, which is stem cell mobilization. And you can look up that on, in Google and learn about that if you like. But what's really important is that our company, the board of our company, wouldn't partner with Genzyme to produce this compound. They said, we want all of it or none of it. And uh, Genzyme said, fine, we'll buy you. And so they bought us, just like that. And uh, that ended my industrial chemical chemistry position. Um, I evaluated what I was passionate about, and that led me to SFU. In between this slide and the last one, I swung a hammer for a year in the cold weather doing construction because I had to. I had a family of uh, one at that time, well, my one child, and my wife was pregnant and due to, no, she had just had Brie, so she had just had Brie, and we needed to put food on the table, and I hadn't become a teacher yet. I knew I wanted to become a teacher, so I started working on that, but I did construction because I needed to. Bachelor of Education, I did the PDP program in 2008, starting in January, ending in December, I walked out of that, and uh, PDP is a one-year postgraduate teacher training program. So with a bachelor's of, of something, um, I was able to step into the PDP program and quickly in one year get my teacher training certificate. Um, practicum at Yale that I did in there, I taught science 10, I taught chemistry 11, and I graduated there. I was hired by the Abbotsford School District in December of 2008 and was very fortunate to start right away as a full-time teacher teaching Science 10 at W.J. Mowat Secondary in Abbotsford. I taught Science 9, Science 10, and Essentials of Math 11, and Earth Science 11 at Yale Secondary the following year, and I stepped into my distributed learning at the Abbotsford Virtual School where this was my responsibility. Actually, this is my current responsibility. I taught more courses than this at one point. I was responsible for more courses. Not physically face-to-face -face teaching these courses, but supporting student learning through distributed learning. Distributed learning takes place when a student is primarily at a distance from the teacher. So they're not sitting there looking at me face-to-face -face like you are right now. Whether he or she is at home or connected to the teacher from um, some other learning facility. So I work with students that are taking other courses in a high school in Abbotsford, but they're not right in my, my school taking the one course that we're interacting in. Distributed learning gives both rural and urban students of British Columbia improved access, more choice, and flexibility to learn outside of the classroom schedules. So this is really important because it gives people freedom to learn in their own time. Um, the vision of DL is to provide a quality, dynamic, and engaging learning environment that all students can in the province can access. Okay? I've got some brochures about our secondary programs up here. You're welcome to come and take one of those. I've got some pens and my business card. If you, are, if you have questions about our talk, you can grab one of my cards and you can shoot me questions and I'll answer your questions for you. My teaching load currently is Science 10, Chemistry 11, and Science and Technology. These are on a paper-based course. So I've got packages, kind of like course one at school, where students come, get a package, do the work, bring it to me, and so on. Online, um, I'm teaching some BC Learning Network courses, Science 9, Foundations and Pre-Calculus Math 10, Apprenticeship and Workplace Math 10 and 11, and Chem 12. Okay, so that's what we have there. The perfect online teacher has web access. They have a new, they 
build new paradigms for students to work in. They've got skill sets for the 21st century. Um, they've got a, new learning environments, a different way of thinking about teaching, information management, and they're creative about publishing how they get their material to their students. This device right here is called the iPhone. How many people in this room have a cell phone or a smartphone device or a personal device of some kind? Okay. Back when I was in university, I had a pager. Okay. Oh man, I was connected. I was so connected. My wife, she actually paged me one night and she asked me out on a date. But I had to phone another the number to get the message that she had called me, right? So it's kind of crazy. Now we text. We surf the internet. We do all kinds of stuff. Mr. Dr. Mosey has an iPad, I see right here, or another tablet of some kind, that he can do a lot of his work from um, that allows us to do lots of things. Online education provides flexibility for students and teachers. As myself, I'm here today, but I, I was sitting in Dr. Mosey's office before this actually working with my students. I mark some assignments and things like that. Langara College offers some online courses. If you go to the Langara website and type online courses, there's lots you can take. Not so many in chemistry, but there are in other departments that are available to you. Many courses and colleges have online courses available for free, but to get credentials, for example, by MIT, you have to pay their tuition. So you can learn all this stuff. The internet's an incredible, invaluable resource. I can learn all kinds of stuff. But I'm not allowed to say I learned that stuff until somebody that's a, in a place of credentialing says, yes, Brian has learned all that stuff. AVS courses are conducted in a Moodle platform, which is a modular on, uh, organizational online distributed learning environment. That's what Moodle stands for. So we work in this environment. There are many other platforms that are available, kind of like operating systems, but for things. And they provide students with a number of ways of interacting with teachers setting in assignments. Blended learning is education that combines face-to-face -face classroom methods, like this, where we're talking, lecturing what Dr. Mosey does here, with computer-mediated activities. I heard you talking to one of your students about some online work that they do, right? Okay, so that is blended learning. You, some of your courses here require an online component, and that is the blend, part of the blended learning. AVS is a forerunner in our district in blended learning. We provide course materials, like the course that I teach, a math teacher in a regular classroom can take that and incorporate that into their um, curriculum. So where does that take us, right? There's so many things to think about when you're in your undergrad. How many of you are in your first year of your undergrad? Second year, right? You know, you're not far along in your educational career, right? And just that's just your education, let alone what are you going to do with this when you're done, okay? Where can a science career take you? Well, my career path was not what I planned. I planned on graduating from Dr. Pierce's lab and working at a company called Nova Gas and sitting pretty in Calgary, ice climbing and rock climbing and doing all kinds of stuff like that. But now it moved me out here and my life is completely different than I planned. Your career may not take you to where you plan, right? You may have a plan and say, I want to become a science, get my science degree so I can become a doctor. Along the way, though, you run into things along the way that changes your path. Finding your passion and chasing it and making a difference in your world will make your career meaningful. Okay? If you ask anybody that's in their career for a while, like Dr. Mosey, he's passionate about teaching. He's passionate about working with people and changing their outlook on things. So am I. That makes things your career meaningful. A science career is a fascinating place to explore the world. There are a number of opportunities that you have um, here at Langara College and beyond at other universities that you can transfer into. The uh, Science Works series that you have, I recommend that you guys come and listen to those talks and hear other people talk about their experiences that they have so that you can go, maybe I'll try that out, right? I see his poster over there for co-op for co education. Co-op education is awesome because you get to still be in school and you're kind of on the hook for this stuff, but not really. You get to try it out. It's like, you know, trying out the pair of shoes or taking the test drive of a career and seeing if that's what you want to do. Before I did co-op, I thought I wanted to be an analytical chemist. Then I became a researcher as a result of my co-op experience. Okay? I want to say thank you to Dr. Uh, Mosey and Langara College for having me. And uh, your career has lots of things that are involved in it. Quality of life is important. Being passionate about what you do is important. And I encourage you to uh, chase your passions. So thanks again for your attention. And thanks for coming today. So questions? Yeah, in the back. 
I've been to a number of these career talks, yeah. and I find it absolutely fascinating that so far everybody has said, this is not what I started off thinking I was going to do. Yeah, that's right. Could you comment on that? What kinds of things should students be looking for as they're wandering what can often be a, a jagged path? Well, it's a jagged path though, right? It's a, uh, uh, it's a rocky journey and you can't necessarily see the end, right? It's kind of like walking around today in the fog. You get out there and it was so thick at some point when I was driving here today that I couldn't actually tell where I was. But I'm still moving forward, okay? Um, what do you need to look at? You need to look at what makes you excited? What kind of homework makes you excited? Okay, that's, that's actually quite important. You know, are you excited about the math that you're doing? Well, if not, then maybe that's not your thing, right? Um, there's many different areas of chemistry, for example, that we talked about, and figuring out which one is kind of cool, which one excites you, would take you in a direction in chemistry in one of those areas, okay? Um, I didn't put a picture of my family up here. But my family and, and my personal life really affects my career. It affects my state when I go to work. It affects my state when I come home from work. And, and doing it for them is really significant and important. Is the money important? Yeah, money is important. Is, it, is money all that's important? Absolutely far from, you know? I say that if you're chasing something to make a million bucks, I hope you're happy. Okay? I hope you're, you, you, you're happy making that million dollars. If you're not passionate about how you made the million bucks, is the million bucks really worth it? You know, like, it's not, it, it, and it's not. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that you can't get a job because of the money that you're making. I agree. I will tell you. I became a teacher kind of because the holidays are actually kind of cool. Okay? I get summers off. I get two weeks at Christmas, I get two weeks at spring break. One year when my, that since I've been teaching, I had 93 days off in, in, in that year, right? But is that the only reason I'm doing that job? Absolutely not. It's because I like talking to people and making and seeing their eyes light up when they learn something new. So, does that answer your question? Thank you. All right, in the back there. I have a couple of questions. Okay. Number one. Yeah. Um, what kind of uh, jobs opportunities are there for real chemists? Well, what kind are there? There's, there's your, th well, what I did, I did, I was a synthetic organic chemist. So you can work at a pharmaceutical company. There are many pharmaceutical companies around this continent and actually around the world um, that require people that have the skills and training in order to be able to work in a lab safely, right? We worked with dangerous chemicals. That cart that you saw, I think that was a green yard reagent in those 12 bottles that were there. Okay, so we bought an ether solution with a, a, a green yard reagent, which is a very reactive compound, and I poured that into the reactor. If I didn't understand how to do that safely, it wouldn't go very well. Um, there are jobs that you could work at, uh, there's a company in, in Vancouver called Ballard Power Systems. How many have heard of Ballard? Ballard makes fuel cells, right? Fuel cells, and there are fuel cell buses like hydrogen buses in our, in our city here that are running because of research that materials and physical chemists did on fuel cells. So there's things like that. I had an opportunity that I could possibly work at Ballard during co-op. So I didn't know about Ballard other than learning about them through the co-op program. Um, other jobs, uh, quality assurance, at, you know, like a, a food processing place, right? Um, where they make, I don't know, potato chips, right? To get that bag of potato chips that says there's 700 grams of potato chips, that's a big bag, right? In that bag, you got to do a few things. You got to make sure the manufacturing works out properly. Make sure the stuff is clean and uncontaminated so that people can eat it. Because the moment that Hostess sells a bag of potato chips that kills someone, well, that's not so good for Hostess, right? You know, so that's really important. So there, there's lots of opportunities. I suggest you go right now. To, well, not right now, but look at the Langara website um, for what you can do with uh, with a science degree. There's many opportunities there. Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that that Silica is a very common it's a Vancouver company in, well, it's in Burnaby, and they are actually hiring right now for a, chem for a chemist. Yeah? In the foods um, inspection Good. industry. Good. Right on. Okay. Did I answer all your questions? Sure, thanks. Okay. When do you get into a co-op after the second year or the third year? Well, it depends on the school, and Dr. Mosey, can you answer that for us about co-op cool. here? Generally, uh, here at Langara, if you're interested in a co-op, program, go and talk to the, uh, uh, well, go to the co-op office and talk to them. 
Um, we haven't had a lot of science students going through co-op here in Langear, uh, so we're not necessarily set up, we're not, we're not a big database for jobs, but we still have, if, there's, if there's more people interested, then I think we will st start setting up uh, contacts uh, with industry. I would recommend here probably completing, completing your first year because until you've got first year completed, you probably don't have sufficient enough skills you know, to, oh, be, to be employable in a chemistry related job. Yeah. Um, but uh, even if you only got one, you know, if you, if you went through a co-op program here, even if you got a single work term experience, it's still, it's still better than nothing. Plus, when you switch over to SFU or UBC, they've got their own co-op program. And as Francis, I recommend it. I went through co-op myself, and it's interesting. My experience was kind of the opposite. Well, it's, it's the same opposite. I had work terms uh, that involved organic uh, organic synthesis, and I realized that's what I did. I did not like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So what he liked, yeah. you know, there's several things he learned. He like, uh, you know, this, you know, I, I, did, I did the same thing. You know, I learned. I didn't like that area. That's right. Uh, and I went into analytical chemistry. There, I mean, he didn't like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, each, each to your own, right? You gotta you, you gotta explore for yourself. But it's definitely the only way you're really gonna know whether you would like a particular area is by trying it out. Yeah, exactly. Let's say, well, let's say if you have, if you are about to complete the second year chemistry program, would you be able to get in the co-op? Because I'm only like one course away to complete my second year chemistry. You have, there is a, there is a business, uh, there is a business course you're gonna take, the co-op requires you to take, but has to do with resume and interview writing skills. Right. And that's, uh, but you know, basically talk to the, you know, go to the co-op office, Tell them uh, your interest and see if uh, um, you'd be able to still complete this required uh, business. Because it's a condensed course, so you might be able to complete it you know, in two mm -hmm. semesters. But you should go to the call for top yeah. office to talk to them. Yeah, so big part of, big part of you know, your career is you taking the initiative to learn things. You know, like that's a great question. And I can tell you the answer, but until you get up out of your chair and you go and ask those questions, Nothing's going to change, right? And that's, that's a whole lot. That's actually a lot of what happened to me is I ask questions and I challenge people and I learn stuff. And, I, and, and you know, it's, it's said that the day you stop learning is the day you're not living anymore, right? You know? And I learn stuff every day. I fly fish and I learn stuff when I'm out in the forest, right, that makes a difference in my, in my fishing experience and stuff. Yes, sir? What do you mean that way you want to learn is to keep challenging things? Well, yeah, to keep challenging things. The way you learn is to keep challenging things and yourself, right? What you know? does challenging things mean? What does it mean? It means... Well, well can it mean challenging people's points of view? Pardon me? Can it mean challenging people's points of view on things? Oh, yeah, cha challenging pe people's points of view. That's really important because if your point of view isn't cha challenged, um, then it might not change, right? When I, when I started university, I never thought about becoming a teacher, but then I got forced kind of into, into that role as, an undergr as a graduate student, and I found out that my point of view was actually kind of different, right? It, it changed my point of view, so, so that's really good. So. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your attention and uh, questions today, so thank you.